I'm going to start with a story from Matthew chapter 19. And this is also a little bit different if you've been here and heard me preach. I promise I'm going back to the seat. That's my plan. If I can't stay on it, I'll just have to live with me. This is in Matthew 19, um, 16 through 22. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? He, he's asking him, What do I got to do to go to heaven? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replies. There is only one good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, shall not commit adultery, not steal, not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? And then, what am I still missing, God? What's, what's missing from my life? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. A few years ago, our school district went through a massive conversion from Microsoft to Google. If you're not a computer person, initially that won't sound like that big a deal, or you may not even understand yet what that means, but I'll work to explain that to you a little bit. Uh, this changed the world that we worked in. If you don't know a lot about computers, at some point in your life, you probably have had somebody's told you to type a paper on a computer. That's unless you did, lived in the typewriter days, and if, if you did, then just follow me. It'll make sense, I promise. If you've ever typed a paper on a computer, you probably use something called Microsoft Word. Hey, raise your hands. Who's, who's used Microsoft Word? Yeah, look at that. See? And you can explain to your neighbor if they say, I don't know what he's talking about. You can explain that to your neighbor. Not right now. It might embarrass them, but just do it, but just do it later. There's a program that Google has called Google Docs that is the equivalent to Microsoft Word. Only Google will do more than Microsoft. Google Docs has this option where you can share a file. Now, when I say share, if you're familiar with Microsoft Word, you're thinking you save it, you have to add it as an attachment to an email or put it on one of them flash drives. Or if you go way back, you might remember the floppy disk. Or even before the floppy disk, the bigger one that looked like film from like a camera, right? like, a, like a Polaroid picture. That's just, now this, that, that song came to my mind, shake it like a Polaroid picture. All right. <laughs> I'm ADHD just a little bit. Um, but Google is all electronic. It's all digital. There's no need for the flash drives or the floppy disk or the CDs or the DVD-ROMs. There's a little blue button on there that says share. And when you click that button, you get this screen. You're able to enter the email address of another person that you want to share this file with and then before you actually click done, it makes you choose what rights the person you're sharing the file with has to that file. You can see three options there. It's a drop-down box right below where that, where that pencil is at on the far right-hand side of the screen. So you decide who you want to share it with, and then you give them options as to what rights they have to your file. You can allow them to view it, that means they just get to see it, can't do anything with it, just look at it. They can comment on it, which comments kind of go out to the side. They don't actually change the file itself, and I'll talk more about that later. Or edit it. If you give them rights to edit it, they can take anything you've written so far and completely change it. Not just some of it. They could erase your whole paper and start all over again. When you give someone rights to edit it, you by default give them rights to all three. They can view it, they can comment on it, and they can edit it. It strikes me that the word file, which is what it is, if you rearrange the letters, makes another word.
When I rearrange the letters of the word foul, it makes the word life. Pretend with me for just a moment that you are typing a story this morning. Your story. Only let's pretend that you're not writing a story on a computer or a file, but a real story that is your life. Instead, when it comes to your life, what rights does God have to speak into your life? Does He see you? Do you want to hear from Him? Do you give Him permission to change your story? Let's talk for a minute about your life and um, what rights God has in it. Uh, first, we're going to talk about view. He can view your life without you ever giving him permission. Do you know that? If some of you have a parent or a grandparent that told you that going, growing up that God sees everything. He hears everything. He knows everything. And you lived your life scared to death. <laughs> Right? Because you'd have this thought pop in your head like, oh, 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 Jesus sees that. He sees that. I can't do that. Rara does that sometimes and he gets tore up. That was one of the reasons he was tore up this week. But do you recognize that God doesn't need your permission to view your life? He sees you as you are, where you are, like you are. He knows everything about you. There's a scripture in Psalms that I want to share with you. Scholar, pull that up, please, the next, the next slide. Where David says, God, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You know my thoughts from afar, meaning you know, God, you know what I'm going to think before I even think it. All the days of my life were written in your book before even one of them came to be. God doesn't just view you. He sees all of you, and then individually, He sees all of you as an individual. You serve a God who already knows and sees everything about you and everything that you are. There are things you don't think anyone knows about you that he knows. And it's because he sees you already, where you are, as you are. And he doesn't have to have permission because you belong to him. The young man in our story already knew that God saw his life. And he really wanted to know what Jesus thought about it. So he asked him, God, you, you see my life. You know me. You know who I am, how I am, what I think, what I say, what I do. What do you think about all of that? Am I good enough? When this young man walked up to Jesus, he was asking God, he was giving God permission to comment on his life. Not change his story. He wasn't ready to give God rights to edit his story, but he wanted to know what God thought about his story. So he asked him in so many words, God, what do you think about my life? <laughs> when you ask God to comment on your life, there are certain ways that you do that. One of them you're doing right now. When you come to church, you're giving me permission, with God's help, to speak into your life. Most of you have not ever given me permission to edit your life, which I don't need that permission because that's not my job. But you give me a chance to speak into your life, to add a comment. You know the way you're living. You have a view of yourself, which it's, we can talk about that for a while, but your view of yourself is not the accurate view, by the way. Whatever you think of yourself, you ask 10 other people, they will not think the same thing that you think about yourself. That's a social psychology class that we'll get into another day. 
But when you show up here, you're giving me permission to comment on your life. You can take a comment and do whatever you want to do with it. You can apply it to your life. You can let it go in one ear and out the other. You can make jokes about it when you leave this place, hopefully not while you're here. <laughs> but a comment doesn't necessarily change anything about your story. Just like this man that asked Jesus, what do you think about my life? And Jesus tells him. When he tells him what he has to do, then the man has to decide, how is this comment going to impact my life? Am I going to let it change me? Or am I going to leave this encounter exactly like I came to it? So the man allows Jesus to comment. One step further than a view, but not quite the place where he's ready to change or edit his story. Pull up that next picture, Skylar. You can see I, I showed you an example of what a comment looks like. You see on the right side there, the left-hand side is my story. That's actually this sermon. So you might see some things in there that didn't actually make it into the sermon. That was from earlier in the week. But to the right, I commented on my own story. Why did you do this? What's interesting about comments, when I print this story out, even with that comment on there, guess what's nowhere on the story? The comment didn't make it. When it's added, it's food for thought. Maybe you should think about this. Why did you do this? Why did you say that? What if you move this paragraph here? What if you were to change that? Have you ever came to God and said, God, take a look at my life. What about it needs to change according to your will and your purpose for my life? When you ask that question, God will give you an answer. Chances are, before I even get to the end of this sermon, you will already have a thought on your head that came from the Holy Spirit that says, maybe this is what should change about your life. Because we have ways of feeling convicted, or feeling ashamed, even though my purpose in anything I say to you is not to bring shame to your life, but to make you think about the God that loves you and wants to get you free from that shame. There's a button on that comment once I see it that I can click that says resolve. And when I click that button, do you know what happens to the comment? <laughs> it goes away. It doesn't change my story. It's gone from the screen. I see it no more. I've shared things before with people and they've made comments that I didn't like and I said, hurry, hurry, get that off of there. I click that resolve button. Whew. I'm glad that's over. <laughs> Did you know people sometimes won't come to church because they're convicted about their self, themselves, their life? They get tore up about something sitting in here and they can't wait to get out the door to whew, hurry up and get that over with. My goodness, I don't want to think about that anymore. Let's put that in the closet and shut the door. We'll deal with that some other time. It's a dangerous way to deal with our comments. But those comments only make it into the story if you let them. You can cast them off out of your story, pretending like they were never there. Or you can carefully consider those comments and wonder if it should change your life. You have that power. Nobody else does. You had to give me permission to speak into your life like I'm doing right now. When the rich young man stepped into Jesus' world that day and said, tell me what I must do to get a home in heaven, he's asking, what should I change about my life to make sure that I'm going to get there? Then Jesus told him what was missing, and he didn't like his answer. Does God ever speak into your life and you don't like what he has to say? I 
That's the reason for the comment box, right? Well, you can say it, but I'm not real sure I want to do anything with it. The Bible tells us in John 1, 14, that Jesus came and he was full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. It means that he was 100% full of grace, which is my favorite part. I hope it's yours too because I recognize my need for it. And he was also 100% full of truth. Grace means I will love you no matter what. Truth means I will be honest with you no matter what. Jesus was full of both of those things. We all love grace, but sometimes we don't like the truth. When I was working on my, my doctorate, I encountered my least favorite part of that degree, and it's called the dissertation process. Dissertations are extremely long papers. Who likes writing papers? <laughs> Dissertations turn into books. I should have brought mine. Mine's a hardbound copy. It's in the library, in some college libraries. It's not that good, so it didn't make the good ones. <laughs> Come on, laugh a little bit. Make me feel better. Uh, I need an applause sign like on David Letterman or whatever. Some of y'all don't even know who David Letterman is. But the dissertation phase lasts for about a year. Sometimes it can last longer. So let me lay this out for you. You spend months and months and months reading research. Doesn't that sound like fun? Research is not an illustrated children's book with pictures, textures, sounds when you open the page of bunnies hopping and making noises, whatever bunnies do. I shouldn't have said ducks or something. I don't know what bunnies do. <laughs> research papers are in small print. They use big words. Sometimes I need a book to read the book. Months and months and months of reading research turns into months and months and months of writing something new that you're learning about that research. I was a few months into the process. I had been reading. I was probably six months into the process. I had been reading and reading and reading and writing and writing and writing, and I was 30 pages into my dissertation. 30. Some of us don't like to write a one-page paper or a two-page paper. You can make stuff up for a couple of pages. Some of you learned that too. Amen. I promise you, you can't make up 30 pages worth. You run out of stuff to say. That's even after you've transitioned to the King James Version where you add these, ands, us, thens, everywhere you can to make it more words. 30 pages in and I hand it in to my advisor and say, give me some feedback on this. Here it is for you to view I would like some comment. He read it, and two days later, he handed it back to me. He said, Dr. Van, what do you think? He said, I think this won't work. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, you're not going anywhere. I think you're headed down the wrong road. I think you're wasting your time. I said, well, what can I do? This is after six months. This is not 30 minutes and three Red Bulls later. This is six months of my life. And Andrew can testify, all I did was read and write. That's all I had time to do. I said, well, what can I do with it? He said, you can start all over again. <laughs> I didn't like what he said. But what other options did I have? So I started all over again. And I did it because the only way that would prove to work out in my life is if I took the comments and incorporated them into my story. And if I didn't, I was on a dead end road going nowhere. If you give God the permission to speak into your life but are unwilling to do what He asks you to do, your life is going nowhere. You're on a dead-end road. 
And sometimes life feels like it's missing the sign because you don't even recognize that you're on that dead end road. But I promise you, if you know what you're supposed to do, how you should live your life, and you refuse to do it, you are going nowhere. And it's the same reason this young man in our story turned around and walked away because he heard the comment and he wasn't willing to put it into his story. And he knew he didn't need another conversation. He didn't need to hear any more truth from Jesus about what he should do with his life. He'd heard enough. Little did he know if he would ask God to forgive him of his fascination and fixation with, with his possessions that the other side of that coin that's full of grace would have given him freedom from that. He wasn't willing to take the comments and add them to his story. There was nothing else to be said. Jesus said, here's the truth. Now you deal with it. It's great to let God speak into your life. But if you are unwilling and dismiss the truth he speaks and it doesn't inform your life, you will never experience all that He wants to do in you, for you, and through you. <laughs> the rich man heard the comments of Jesus, but he wasn't willing to let them transform his life. He walked away, and he was sad about it. I'd imagine that Jesus was sad too. It reminds me of the story where Jesus was on the donkey riding out of town and he was on a city on a hill overlooking Jerusalem and he saw the people down there that, that were without him and he cried and he said, if they had only known on this day what would bring them peace. I'd imagine Jesus felt the same way the day this man turned his back and walked away. Wondering how in the world can this man find more satisfaction in this world than what I'm trying to give him. Does he wonder the same thing about your life? Does he wonder how a relationship, your stuff, your priorities, Does he look at your life and wonder how all those things can have more importance to you than he does to you? He wanted to know the truth. But he wasn't willing to accept it, to live it. He wanted God's opinion, but he didn't want to submit to God's authority in his life. And when he walked away from Jesus, he walked away from Jesus. When I read that story, I don't see Jesus chasing after him because Jesus had already spoken to his life, this is what I want from you. And when he was unwilling to do it, Jesus didn't condemn him, he condemned himself. It works that way for us too. He wouldn't give God rights to edit his story. You know, it all sounds good until we fully consider the cost. 
I'd love a Jeep Wrangler. I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> a pool sounds great, but I don't want to make the trade. For some of us, getting married sounds fun, but don't want to make the commitment. You know, I'd like to follow Jesus, but what is it going to cost? The saddest part for me about this story is what this young man failed to realize. When he heard the words of Jesus that day that said, this is what you want to do if you're going to follow me. All he could hear was what God was trying to take away from him. And he became so distracted by what he was giving up, he didn't recognize that what he was going to get back was more. You and I stand in a place every day of our lives where Jesus wants to trade in the very best deal you could ever imagine on something in your life that the wheels are falling off of that you might not even see yet. Whatever he's asking you to give up is nothing compared to what you're gaining when you allow him to edit your life. <laughs> you recognize that's the same, it's the same story that Adam and Eve got distracted by, right, in the garden when the serpent says, God is holding out on you. He said, this fruit, it won't kill you. God doesn't want you to eat it because then you'll see what he sees. You'll know what he knows. God is trying to keep you from something good. That's why you should go ahead and eat it. We still live that same life. We feel like we can't give this up or we can't give that up because somehow in all this, God is trying to take some pleasure away from our lives. He's trying to take away the things that will kill you and give you something that will bring you to life for the first time in your life. I think the truth, Psalms 84 says, no good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. The truth is God's not holding out on you but it's likely that some of you are holding out on him. Sometimes God gives ultimatums. You ever had one of those? Anybody ever gave, given you an ultimatum? Either you <laughs> or else. I won't give that to you because the work God's doing in your life is not for me to beat you into mercy about. <laughs> this microphone would hurt for the first lick or two and then it's, you know, it's over. You have to choose whether or not you're going to let God edit your story. And I don't know if you're worried about what it's going to mean that you have to give up. I don't know if you're scared. I don't know if you think you really don't have to give him yourself and it's all going to work out. And I didn't even talk about the 99.9% .9 of the things the man in the story was doing right. He was doing a lot of stuff right. It's just, 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 just this one thing, you know. And if you really want all I have for you, you've got to get rid of that one thing. You've got to let that go. What is that thing in your life? And are you only going to let God bring that to light in your life? Or are you willing to let him change your life? Writes to comment 
they don't go far enough. You got to let him rewrite your story.